highly recommend this book. <clears throat> Everybody Dies, Don't Feel Bad. Uh, a children's book for grown-ups. Now, it's light, it's funny, it's normalising death, it's using humour, it's salient, it captures attention. It, it does all the things we're wanting to do uh, in death anxiety work. I'll show you some of the, the book pages. Everybody dies, and someday you will too. And then you, you write your name. Here lies Ross Menzies, born. And then on the died line, I can't read that, but from memory it says, someone will fill that in for you. Uh, because you, you feel you won't be here. 157 people die every 60 seconds. Are you still there? Um, I love that page. I remember when I first read it, sort of cheering, but uh, yeah, I still am. 157 people just went, but it wasn't me, that's okay. Match the corpse to the cause of death. Uh, you know, because children's books have these draw the lines across, and uh, this wonderful book does as well. Can you, can you work out who died which way? So, that, so that's an example of normalising death, isn't it? Lightening death, uh, tr trying not to treat death in such tragic ways. Normalising and using death as a solution. This is from Kobo Dashi, the founder of an esoteric school of Buddhism in Japan. And uh, we use some of the material from Kobo Dashi, uh, who, who's written extensively on ideas of impermanence. These have only been translated quite recently uh, into, into English. In order to attain serenity of mind, Kobodashi says, and become a person who is like the clouds in the sky and the whirling snow, consider that everyone's fate is to become a corpse. Kobodashi is suggesting that it's reflecting on the fact that I die that is part of the solution. Reflecting and acceptance of the fact that I die is actually part of the solution. Not, not the problem. When you tremble with worry, contemplate the truth that all elements of this world are non-substantial and impermanent. See the same idea there. If I'm, if I'm desperately anxious about something in the workplace or desperately anxious about a social interaction or something else, consider the truth that all elements are non-substantial and impermanent. impermanent. This moment passes, another moment comes, I will be long gone. So contemplating impermanence becomes part of the solution to anxiety rather than the, than the problem. I mentioned the unlikelihood of existence. One of the, one of the tasks that um, I give individuals is to go back in their family tree two or three generations and find out how those people met. How did their parents meet? How did their grandparents meet? Even if you do this two generations, it's very interesting. Where were they living? Did they meet when they were traveling? Were they living in the same country? Because just remember, from a biological point of view, uh, and this is this idea of, uh, I'm, I'm lucky to be here. From a biological point of view, somebody might be standing at this podium, but the likelihood that it was me is low. My mother and father had to meet. My mother and father were living in different parts of Australia, but their parents had to meet, and they had to produce opposite gender children who had to meet. And you can start to very easily uh, sort of contemplate the probabilities and the improbabilities that, that that Irish woman happens to travel to London and meets that man who was engaged at the time but breaks it off and marries her and decides to emigrate who then meets and so on and so on. Very quickly, you start to see it is exceptionally, exceptionally lucky uh, that I become an existent. So a lot of what we're doing is focusing on that, the celebration of the fact that I have existence and that although an average lifespan is 750,000 hours, it's 750,000 hours in the theme park that I didn't, I, you know, I wasn't promised. I didn't need to get. It could have been, it could have been none. It's a very interesting task to start celebrating the fact that I got life. 
it, it reminds us of work of uh, a quote from Richard Dawkins. This, these are the opening sentences of his book, Unweaving the Rainbow. And look at that first sentence. We are going to die, and that makes us the lucky ones. You see this celebration of death rather than uh, uh, I'm ripped off because I die. Most people are not going to die, he goes on, because they are never going to be born. The potential people who could be here in my place, but who will in fact never see the light of day, outnumber the sand grains of Arabia. Certainly those unborn ghosts in include greater poets than Keats, scientists greater than Newton. We know this because the set of possible people allowed by our DNA so massively exceeds the set of actual people. In the teeth of these stupefying odds, it is you and I in our ordinariness that are here. Uh, it's quite, quite uh, powerful, I think. And Bill Bryson, uh, this is another, another section that we use uh, in, in, in talking about this unlikelihood of, of existence. Bill Bryson writes along a similar vein, and we dedicate some time in this package to looking at these sorts of ideas and quotes in clinic. Consider the fact, he says, that for 3.8 billion years, a period of time older than the Earth's mountains and rivers and oceans, every one of your forebears on both sides has been attractive to find a mate, healthy enough to reproduce and sufficiently blessed by fate and circumstances to live long enough to do so. Not one of your pertinent ancestors was squashed, devoured, drowned, starved, stuck fast, or untimely wounded before delivering, before delivering a tiny charge of genetic material to the right partner at the right moment to perpetuate the only possible sequence of hereditary combinations that could result eventually Astoundingly and all too briefly in you. I wish he hadn't put the all too briefly. I love the quote until that bit. For death anxious people, that's the bit they don't like. But you can see, I hope, what we're trying to get at. If you take life as a given, I had to be here, it's easy if you start at that point in your timeline to feel ripped off that I have to go and the health anxious person um, you know, is struggling with that idea. But if you start to understand, particularly things like that, we are going to die, and that makes us lucky because the sentence of death means you've got life, uh, becomes, quite a, becomes quite a powerful idea. I've, I've mentioned that task, the, the unlikelihood of your existence. I've mentioned this theme park before. We, we, we use a theme park metaphor through this work. Um, and this was partly because uh, I, I read a piece a while back about uh, Disney. You, you know, you may not know that Disneyland's motto, um, I don't know if it still is, but for many, many years was the happiest place on earth. Disneyland was the happiest place on earth, they said. Everyone was happy in Disneyland because it's so spectacular. And we started to talk and think about the fact that uh, Disneyland as a theme park certainly doesn't compare to the theme parks that we live in. I live in Sydneyland. Uh, Sydneyland's really cool, right? There's Restaurant World, uh, Beachland, right? If I start to conceive of my environment around me in theme park terms, uh, it's a very rich environment that I live in. The, the, uh, the street that my practice is on, in, uh, in Glebe, on one street, and it's a sort of an inner city street, it's a very colourful street in terms of restaurants and bars and so on, I can buy more t-shirts, more music, more meals from more countries, more nationalities, uh, and, and so on, than in any uh, theme park, in any Disneyland. So we start to get people to realise that living richly in their 750,000 hours, being sensate. This fits in very well with the mindfulness movement. Being very mindful every day of, of the, the, the pleasures of my existence, of, of, of everyday experience and the things I can do. Uh, and, 
and, and of course, you know, so you, so you see I say here, you've won the golden ticket to the chocolate factory. That's a reference to Willy Wonka, you know, he, he won the golden ticket. Uh, well, he got a day in a chocolate factory. Um, I, we, we're suggesting to people, look, in the, in the winning of life, You've won a, a golden ticket that you shouldn't have. Remember, the odds of the odds in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory were much better. There were there were six tickets, I think, on planet Earth inside those chocolate bars. Um, you're a much lower odds of existence than that if you do the maths on you know, going back generationally. You've won the golden ticket, and you've got not a day in a chocolate factory. You've got, on average, seven hundred and fifty thousand hours. I'm coming up to. Uh, 500,000 hours uh, already in the park. It's true that anyone can call out, you know, in the sky, that on the Tannoy, Ross, you're out of the park. I may suddenly feel my chest twinge and collapse, uh, but I've had 500,000 hours in a, in, in a rather exciting theme park uh, on planet Earth. So we ask people from this point of view to see themselves as a, a traveler and, be, and to increase mindfulness, we get them to keep a travel journey, if you like. What did I do today? Uh, what was the best of the things I, I did today? Was it a taste I had? Was it music I listened to? Was it the smile on a friend's face? What was the best of the rest? What was second? So we're trying to encourage mindful consumption of this theme park metaphor. We also use children's books, which might surprise you, but again, um, I tried to make the point earlier that psychologists um, are limited in terms of stimulus salience. We're sitting in an office having conversations with people. It's not the most powerful medium. I think I said earlier, you know, you, you don't have an orchestra that when you're making a really serious or important point, background music isn't building up, the lights aren't dimming, wouldn't that be fantastic? Therapy would be a lot more effective, I think, as you went into a long soliloquy to make an important point that the room changed and the light dimmed. And Now, that'd be great. Well, movies can do that. Movies can do that. They can make their point very carefully. They can script their point. We don't get to script our point. Sometimes when I walk home, I think, I don't think I really explained that concept as well as I'd like to that person. I didn't get to go, cut, I'm just going to write that out again and I'll have another go at those lines. It's all, it's all online. You've got to be performing online. So things like books and film and music have a, a, a scripted, a, a heavily worked through. They're very salient. They can have big impacts on people. And we're trying all sorts of things. For, for many months, the ringtone on my phone was George Harrison's All Things Must Pass. A uh, wonderful song. Um, but I used it as a, a daily reminder of impermanence and death to see what was that experience like from a, an exposure point of view <coughs> and an acceptance point of view. Um, we use children's books that are relevant to this theme. I'll read you um, The Happiest Day of My Life book about impermanence. Harry loved life. He loved smiling at the sun. He loved flattening the grass. He lay on it, jumped on it, and had fun on it. Harry loved trying to fly with the birds. He tried and tried and tried. He loved splashing the fish. In fact, Harry loved life so much he wanted to live forever. One day Harry met a very old man. My name is Harry and I'm going to live forever, Harry said. No one can live forever, Harry. One day you will surely die, said the old man. Harry thought long and hard about what the old man had said. The next day Harry wondered if this was the day that he would die. He didn't smile at the sun or run on the grass or splash the fish or fly with the birds. He just sat and waited. But Harry did not die that day. A new day came, and again Harry wondered if this was the day that he would die. And again, he waited and waited. This was a very sad day for Harry. Time went by, and 
and Harry had sadness in his eyes. Why have you stopped splashing us, asked the fish. I no longer feel happy, he said. The fish felt sorry for Harry. They tried to cheer him up and splashed him, but he was still sad. Why have you stopped trying to fly, asked the birds. Happiness has left my life, he said, and I've forgotten how to find it. I think that's beautifully written. So many of our, of our clients have forgotten how to find it. The birds felt sorry for Harry. Hold out your arms and we'll show you, said the birds. And all the birds lifted Harry so he could fly. Harry saw fields of grass that he'd never played in. He saw lakes with fish that he'd never splashed. Harry saw cities he'd only dreamed of. The sun smiled at Harry and the clouds drifted away. Harry felt happy. And that day he did not die. The next day Harry woke early. I love life so much, I don't want to die sad, he said to himself. He ran on the grass, flew with the birds and splashed the fish. From that day on, Harry lived each day with joy and wonder, as if it was his last. Harry was very happy, and still he did not die. Harry lived for many, many years and grew to be an old man. All his friends were old too. Even though he was too old to run, fly and splash, he still smiled all the time. It was hundred, Harry's hundredth birthday. He received a hundred kisses. Harry blew out his hundred candles. You've all given me great happiness, he said to his friends. You've made this the happiest day of my life. And at the end of that day, Harry did die. Very, very happy. It's a, it's a, a wonderful book. Uh, and I, th I hope you get what I mean about stimulus salience. It's just more powerful than me saying it. Somebody having to read it, think about it, read it again, write some notes on it, answer some comprehension questions about what the messages of it are. It's just more salient. It's more likely to shift people. You might be thinking, well, Harry got to live 100 years. Uh, the odd, the odd client does. The odd client will say, yeah, well, I'd be satisfied with that. I'm just anxious all the time because I don't know I'm going to give, I'm going to live 100 years. Well, I have an answer for that. Bartholomew and the Bug. One more children's book and we'll move on. I, I love this because the bug in question who's happy only gets to live one day. The bug has come into existence, has come into the theme park, <coughs> will have one day in the theme park, and is still content. Let's have a look at Bartholomew. Bartholomew lived in a cave in a forest at the top of a mountain. He spent his days sniffing flowers, snoozing in leafy glades, snacking on berries, and generally taking it nice and easy. But sometimes in the evenings he would climb up to the top of the cliff and watch the twinkling lights down in the valley below. He wondered what they were. And, and what went on there. Perhaps he would go tomorrow or sometime next week. One day, while he was reclining in his favourite spot, a strange little bug flew up and hit him on the nose. It spoke very quickly in a squeaky voice and kept gasping for breath, but eventually Bartholomew managed to work out what it was saying. I'll do the squeaky voice only once. Bright lights! Must find lights! <laughs> Gotta find lights! So the bug is seeking assistance. Bartholomew <coughs> led the bug over to the edge of the cliff to show him where the twinkling lights were down in the valley. But every couple of paces, the little bug got caught in the wind and would end up flying in completely a, a different direction. By the way, in that small print uh, that's going around there, you might be able to see, he's making it clear that he only has one day to live. I haven't got long. You know, I've got to get there, I've got to get to the bright lights. And can you help me bear, he's saying. It seemed obvious the little creature couldn't do this alone. Being a kindly bear with nothing much in particular planned for the day, Bartholomew agreed to help him in his quest. They didn't have a second to lose. Cradling the small insect in his paw, Bartholomew clambered his way to the bottom of the cliff. Then they had to cross a huge river and jump a bottomless canyon. A frog 
directed them through the stinking swamps and over waterfalls until eventually they arrived at a huge concrete road. Bartholomew was devastated. He couldn't read that well, but he knew that 117 was a very big number, and so 117 miles must be a very long way, and that a very long way was sure to take much more than a day to walk. They'd never make it in time. He sat down by the edge of the road with the bug in the palm of his paw. He didn't know how to tell the bug the bad news. But just then, a huge truck pulled up and a hairy-faced man got out, <clears throat> stood beside the road and began to whistle. Bartholomew and the bug very quietly tiptoed out of the undergrowth, climbed onto the back of the truck and hid behind some big boxes. Neither Bartholomew nor the bug had ever travelled so fast in their lives. They were there in record-breaking time. The truck screeched to a halt and Bartholomew and the bug hopped down to take their first glimpse of the bright lights of the big city. But it wasn't what they were expecting at all. There weren't any bright lights, only tall grey buildings. They must have got it wrong somehow. There weren't any lights anywhere. The bug tried to hide his disappointment. But as they wandered through the streets and alleys, they began to notice a few twinkling lights, first one, then two, then more and more until the whole place was awash with a luminescent glow. And with the lights came the buzz of thousands of insects, every shape and size, and all for the same reason, to party. They rode up and down elevators, they drove around in limousines, they dressed in fancy clothes, they sang. They danced till Bartholomew thought his legs would drop off, and some of the bugs did. The bug, of course, is dying. And just as Bartholomew thought he could dance no more, and the first whispers of dawn began to peep their way over the horizon, he noticed the bug staring into the eyes of a rather pretty ladybug, and he thought it was probably time for him to go home. Bartholomew bade farewell to his insect friends and thanked them for a wonderful day. He never went back to the bright lights of the big city, but at the end of each day, when he sits and watches them from his mountaintop, he always thinks of his little bug friend and the fantastic day they spent together. And he can't resist having a little bit of a sing and dance and a party. Again, it's a book, again, it's a book with a very similar sort of message, isn't it? That the fact that death awaits me and awaits me very quick does not mean I can't in a sensate way enjoy my existence, whether I'm here for a short time or for a long time. What's, what, why must that rob me of uh, enjoyment of my existence? So normalising, lightening attitudes to death uh, through these sorts of mechanisms. In terms of reframing, we use other arguments uh, in the reframing com uh, uh, components, the cognitive components uh, the universal experience of non-existence. I do not fear death, Mark Twain said. I've been dead for billions and billions of years before I was born and I have not suffered the slightest inconvenience of it. Um, and it is an interesting argument that many people with death anxiety uh, find quite compelling. I can tell you that many people with death anxiety have not thought about their existence uh, prior to birth and uh, they will routinely, of course, admit that they were not troubled by the battle on the Somme, uh, by, the, by trench warfare, they were not emotional, they were not distressed, they were not here. Um, and that the, 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 the horrors of the, the world has faced prior to their birth caused them no dismay at all. Non-existence they have experienced, which is Mark Twain's point. Um, in fact, you could argue, and some patients have brought this argument up with me, I like it very much and I've used it with others, that in fact humans crave uh, a virtual non-existence in sleep on a nightly basis. We crave the loss of consciousness. We crave, we crave losing consciousness, shutting down, at least on a, on a nightly basis. Uh, why do we fear uh, its cousin, sleep's cousin, death so much? You're probably all aware of Yalong's great work, Staring at the Sun. Uh, it's set. As, a, as, a, as a, a reader with a focus on the concepts of rippling and 
and search, search for meaning. Rippling is almost a denial of non-existence. Yulong's, Yulong's idea there is that every sentence you say, every act you take, uh, continues to have influence because when you speak to someone or you uh, teach someone something or you assist someone, you uh, change them in some slight way and they continue to be in the, in the world and they change someone in some slight way. And, and it's a very powerful concept for those that <coughs> are heartened by seeing some sort of continuance of their influence. And Yulong, of course, uh, as an existential psychotherapist, is very big on search for meaning. Remember, in the first half, in the theoretical part of this workshop, we talked about the existentialists and finding a meaningful life. Um, well, Yulong, of course, picks up on that and starts talking about things like interpersonal relationships and really immersing yourself in interpersonal relationships to find meaning and other ways that people may find meaning. The use of film, as I've mentioned, we use many films. Um, um, yeah, I, I won't play the clip, I think, because I don't think it'll show very well up there, but many of you, I'm sure, have seen Blade Runner. Yes, hands in the air for those that know the film. Yeah, not that many. Um, Blade Runner uh, is a science fiction film of Harrison Ford, uh, is the lead actor, and it's an intriguing film um, we've done studies of the possible impacts of film. We have a sample of people where we did DASs before and after, in the week before, sorry, let me get it right, two weeks before, the week before, um, then watching the film, the week after and the week after. And we've looked uh, in anxiety patients, in a sample of anxiety patients, at which films seem to have um, significant impact in, in uh, changing anxiety and stress and depression scale scores. Of 50 films that we've done that with for various reasons, Blade Runner has the um, highest uh, level of positive change. Blade Runner um, is about a, a set of uh, cyborgs, if you like, called replicants who live for four years uh, they're, they're robotic, but they're actually made of tissue. So their eyes and, and human tissue have been grown and they've been put together. They're bright, they're very bright, they're very fast, they're very strong, but they have a four year lifespan. And the film is looking at what that would be like, what it would be like to know, here I am with strength and vibrancy, but I have a four year lifespan. There is no way around it. Well, the lead character, Roy, here, He's railing against that. He doesn't like the gig. And he's, he's desperately trying to extend his, his lifespan. He's going to be unsuccessful in that. And he's wasting a lot of his time. He's wasting a lot of his time in trying to extend his lifespan. Until a very powerful scene at the end of the film where he accepts that it's time to die and he gives the, a very famous, you should Google it and watch the scene, a very famous soliloquy where he talks about, I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. He starts to talk about the moments of his life, the richness of the moments of his life, and, uh, and reflects on the things he's done and seen in his life, and then at the end of that, in a smiling manner, uh, says, time to die. And we watch him shut down in a very dramatic, very powerful scene, um, he, his head bows with his death, the camera stays on him, but just on a minute, there's a minute of film where there's just a soundtrack in the, in the background looking at Roy who's died. It's good exposure, but it's also good for reframing. So Roy is reframing uh, his existence. Another interesting... Um, <clears throat> Another interesting way to reframe for people that are afraid of death, and I, uh, this is one you could explore with, depending upon uh, the particular case that you're dealing with, is focusing on the difficulties of living. Again, Mark Twain was right on top of this. All say, how hard is it that we have to die? A strange complaint to come from the mouths of people who have had to live. He's commenting on the fact that life is very difficult. 
Uh, and obviously for our patients uh, crippled with mental health issues, often extremely difficult. There's a strange irony, isn't there, in a, a desperate fear of impermanence. They'll often say, I'm at my best when I'm asleep. I'm at my best when I'm asleep. I like to sleep. I sedate myself to get out of the state I'm in. I drink or I take uh, sleeping aids to get out of the state I'm in. Yet they live in, in terror of that state being a continual state, a state they crave, as I said regularly. Um, Herodotus, uh, who's the, regarded as the father of history, wrote about a particular group of people uh, who, whenever a baby is born, so he tells us, its relatives gather around to grieve for the troubles it's going to have to endure now that it has been born, and they recount all the sufferings of human life. When anyone dies, however, they bury him in high spirits with jubilation on the grounds that he's been released from so many ills and is now in a perfectly happy state. Well, whether we agree with a happy state, at least it would be hard to argue a state of discontent that the person might be regularly in. And uh, the use of act. I mentioned before that um, when you revisit act from an existential point of view, there are striking, striking overlaps. I've never actually uh, directly asked Stephen Hayes the extent to which uh, existential issues influenced him. But if you pick up, get out of your mind and into your life, for example, um, after the chapters on diffusion, you get mindful consumption, so you get be mindful, be present, be present, very similar to the ideas we're talking about. Then you get the eulogy tasks, so you get writing your own funeral speech, write on your own tombstone, and after those tasks, in which Stephen Hayes is getting you to confront the fact that you'll die, and doing it at, at length, you write three versions of your funeral task in Get Out of Your Mind and Into Your Life. After that, come the, uh, let's identify who you wish to be in the time you have on earth. Who do you wish to be as a father? Who do you wish to be as a son or daughter? <clears throat> who do you wish to be as a member of a community? This is the identifying your values, living an authentic uh, life. Well, that harks right back to the existentialist. All of that work harks back to the existentialist. So in many ways, if I was suggesting to you to look closely at the tasks of any particular modality in CBT, um, I would look closely at many of the ACT tasks. There are many things within ACT that look like they might be useful from this point of view. And I think, um, I don't know of any ACT researchers, I'm certainly not one of those, I don't know of any of them that are looking at this question, but if you're a research student out there and you're looking for a question, I would be incredibly interested in uh, collaborating on projects that looked at the extent to which death, dread and existential issues went down with ACT, uh, as opposed to other uh, problems. As I said, it's a, there's an alignment with existentialism, the emphasis on values-based living, and, and note also the de-emphasis on acute symptom reduction. When ACT was developed, there was this really strange notion, strange to me, that we're not that interested in symptom reduction. I remember being completely confused about what they were talking about because that, that was what I was trained in. I was trained in getting rid of symptoms. Persons come in with panic, panic attacks, I'm gonna get rid of their panic attacks. But you know, we talked in the theoretical sections of this workshop earlier, didn't we, about, you know, is that, is that the ideal thing to do? Should we be just focusing on the primary symptom that the person currently presents with? Or should we be going for something grander than that? So it's an interesting, it's an interesting uh, area. The explicit elimination of avoidance is a component of ACT. You know, uh, re-scripting, re-scripting is an interesting approach Within, within CBT, but sometimes it ends up with avoidance. I was at a talk uh, not too long ago in which the researcher had, had done this. This was a people with illness anxiety disorder, and one group of individuals were given exposure. 
they were given exposure to think about having the illness that they uh, were worried about and then contemplating a bad outcome. And the other group uh, were to uh, think about having the illness and then the outcome's fabulous. Treatment goes well, they re-script that first story. Treatment goes well, the disorder goes away, uh, all is good. And the researchers said, well, it looks like that re-scripted uh, work is better because people got very anxious in the other task and the re-scripted task led to reductions in anxiety. Well, the re-scripted task told them they were going to live. It just said to the illness anxiety people, it's all good, you're going to live. I'm not surprised they get temporal reductions in anxiety, but um, is that really the way we want to go? We, we want to get people to confront. The standard approach in behavioural work is confront the fear, not, not uh, re-script it away as if that's not going to happen. We've tried other things uh, for exposure, regular reminders of death. I'll give you one that I do, um, this is something I started doing a year or two ago uh, myself and I get people to do this, um, is touching your eye sockets a few times a day. Uh, if you put your fingers, go to, go to the eye socket where you can feel the eye socket of a human skull, right? Just below that very thin layer of of, of skin, you will clearly identify a human skull. And it, it might seem, well look, I know I've got a human skull, why would I do that? It's a stark reminder, it's a stark reminder that I'm no different to anyone else. There's a thin layer of flesh at the moment, and I've got a muscular system, I can move my arms, look. And I can move my legs, and that's a good thing, because my legs can take me into the old town tonight in the theme park and I can sit and I can have a nice plate of food that some lovely people will make for me. I hand over some tokens in the theme park, some coins, and these people make me this, this lovely stuff. It's very sensate, I enjoy it a lot. But I will not have mus muscles around the bones, flesh on the skins for all that long. So uh, I think I'll go into the old town tonight. There'll come a time when uh, the eye sockets are exposed, as it were. So it's that confronting my impermanence, not moving away from my impermanence, confronting my impermanence and seeing if it can drive behaviour. There's a chap in the Southern Highlands, uh, a couple of hundred kilometres from Sydney, who is, makes very elaborate coffins for you to put in your living room. Uh, I wanted to do this as an exercise, but my, my wife is... Um, refused uh, on the <laughs> she's a very sensible woman she she says this will traumatize the children um, but the idea is that you you actually get the coffin made that you will die in so that when a friend calls and says hey let's go out you, you're up for a movie tonight my normal response is I'm very tired the idea is you look at the coffin and go yeah uh, I think I'll go to that movie I've got stuff to see, I've got books to read, I've got movies to see, and I will not have a musculature to take me there forever. Yeah? And you lie down in a coffin, yeah. The, the, the comment that was made, uh, for those that couldn't hear, was there's a Korean therapy in which <coughs> you write your own obituary and you lie down in a coffin. and. That is becoming more popular. It's an interesting exposure task. I know, Rachel, you've, you've done the task of uh, lying in a coffin and, and having the, the, the lid closed. Uh, it's an interesting exposure task. Um, and it, it, yeah, it, it exists in a few programs related to this. She might agree for me to go and lie in a coffin somewhere. I suspect she would agree to that. Strangely, intuitively, I feel she, she'd be okay with that. Um, <laughs> That the, the bracelet on the side is a Tibetan skull bracelet, um, which again, I've had many, many clients in the, in using this component uh, go and buy. Uh, it's, it's carved out of a yak bone in the shape of human skulls, 
and it's a reminder that you know I too uh, face this future. But there are many other things. I hope you. What I'm really wanting to give <clears throat> is the impression that this is very creative. You've got to get creative. Um, this is a this is a a, a game that um, Rachel found called Mortals. That's my youngest child, Jude, who's uh, he's six now, and uh, we we played the game with him recently. So in Mortals, you, you, you get a, a set of cards, and on the cards are questions about, uh, you know, name an item. So an example might be name an item that you would uh, like to leave for someone. Who is the person and what is the item? Or, uh, you know, various questions about death and dying and loss to get people to have conversations about this rather than avoid. Uh, the question that Jude was answering was, what will you regret when you die? And he said, not sleeping more. Loves his sleep, this boy. Um, I'm not sure that was a, that was a six-year-old's answer. And also, not playing with my Beyblades enough. He loves these, these little toys called Beyblades. Um, but he was happily playing this game, happily talking about uh, issues in and around death. Normalising death uh, is, is sort of the key here rather than avoidance. If you like, in your long term, staring at the sun. We've completed an initial proof of concept, just a pragmatic trial in which we took 36 treatment-seeking individuals at a large private practice with different diagnoses. And really, I don't want to talk about this too much, but I just want to show you that they uh, an average of 36.4 years, 21 females in the 36, 4.2 lifetime diagnoses, uh, 2.5 current diagnoses, so they, they had a couple of diagnoses on average in the past that had gone away. <clears throat> and all participants in this proof of concept trial received standard behavioural work, exposure behavioural experiments, cognitive work, for their primary diagnosis, standard work, with one third of session time spent administering the death and anxiety treatment components that I've talked about. So one third of therapy time while they were doing their standard work would be on uh, one or more of these components. Mean sessions to discharge 16.4 with a range of eight to 34 sessions. And all, all that was done in this initial trial is just pre to post measurement. Um, what is good is that the, those last four scales, the Colette Lester, uh, death of self, death of other, dying of self, dying of others, went down dramatically. Those, those pre-treatment scores on those are high, much higher than community averages. Uh, the scores on the right, their post-treatment scores, uh, are actually slightly better than community averages. So they end up with this death work with slightly lower fears than the general community have about death. The rest of their scores improved, but again, remember they were getting standard treatment. So we don't know what's doing what here. It's a proof of concept trial. It's showing that you can do death work alongside this other work. So, some conclusions. The findings suggest that death anxiety components can be administered alongside standard CBT procedures. And, and research directions, where, where do we need to go now? Does a specific death anxiety treatment enhance outcomes across the mental disorders? We don't know that yet. Obviously what we need to be doing is, is trials of these death components. So we need to do standard treatment with or without these death components. What do these death components do? I think we've got very good reason now uh, to believe that uh, uh, fears of death are highly related to psychopathology across uh, what would have been traditionally called the neuroses. We've got some evidence that um, through the mortality salience work of Rachel and Ilan Dan Nimrod, we've got, we've got now evidence that even minor priming 
can trigger the person's pathology. Remember in that study, what's so fascinating in that 2017 study in the Journal of Abnormal is just minor pri priming about tell us what you think happens at the moment of death buried in a stack of other questions. Remember they had stacks of questions. There were these two questions buried in there. That was enough to elicit three times the community standard hand washing people that were washers and had had those questions. Minor death priming and outcomes pathology. Um, obviously what's needed is more of that sort of research across different disorders and some of that research is going on at the moment. Does death priming increase uh, generalised anxiety and, and other other uh, uh, problems, other anxiety problems and so on. Is general improvement across treated, uh, treatment accounted for by change in death scale scores? What happens to death scale scores just with standard treatment? Do they go down? Do they not go down? We don't know much about that yet. And what can we learn from the existentialists? What does living an authentic life do for death anxiety? Is meaning the key to the problem? Again, uh, that's something that we need uh, more work to explore. And, and particularly, I think we've got to learn from our colleagues uh, working in grief and anticipatory grief, end of life clinicians. We were very lucky last year to have Bob Neymeyer in Australia for the World Congress of CBT. Um, uh, Bob is a, uh, perhaps arguably the leading worker in the world with uh, grief, uh, CBT programs for grief, pr produced uh, uh, wonderful um, treatment paradigms for grief. Now if you think about it, if you can take somebody who's facing uh, the death of a loved one or their own dying process, if you, can, if you have interventions that seem to bring them to some contentment, we need to know more about what they're doing. <laughs> Because if they can do that for people that are dying or have just lost someone, here we're talking about people that are not dying. We're talking about people with fear of death at 10 or 20 or 30 years of age that are not actually facing that right now. So I think increasingly we'll, we'll borrow uh, procedures that are coming out of that, that, that field. I can tell you that a lot of what goes on in that uh, grief world is meaning making. A lot of what Bob Neymar's uh, work is about is meaning making. Can I uh, feel meaningful? Can, can I find meaning in, in what I'm doing in life? Can I find meaning in my, in my daily activities? That that seem, and finding meaning in a life seems to a, a, a very much shorten grief. And uh, that's why I think we're, we're so interested so interested in uh, the existentialists and, and, lear and, and learning about living this authentic, authentic life. We've got um, about 15 minutes to go. I can do one of two things. Why don't we have a show of hands? Would we like an open discussion and question time or would we like one more interesting case? I don't think we'll be able to do both. You want an interesting case? Yeah. Case? do have time for a case. This is a case that I treated <clears throat> that I do think is terribly interesting in illustrating these ideas. Stephanie, 28 year old postgrad student presented in 2015 with a long history of panic disorder, illness anxiety disorder, OCD that had begun with lock checking in her teens. She'd been visiting a family in Australia for a planned short stay when she had to attend the funeral of a cousin. Her OCD, after many relatively stable years, returned with a vengeance. In addition to broad contamination fears from cutlery, public services, toilets, her symptoms included a range of other very interesting features. Aggressive obsessional thoughts and images of death to family members that had to be changed to positive images. She would have intrusions, particularly of a sister in a body bag. So she would have images of the sister lying in a body bag and she would have to then mentally correct the image and change it to something else. 
But this I found fascinating and intriguing. She would purposefully picture her dead father with her at outings and events. And she would invite her dead father to the events. I remember early in treatment, she came in very, very distressed because she'd gone to see a jazz band play and she'd forgotten to invite her father. Now remember, her father's dead. She'd forgotten to, in her mind, invite her father and then purposely, when she was there, picture her father still being there. She had very strong hoarding features, any items her father had touched, she had to keep. And she would compulsively order and reorder and arrange photos of dead relatives in complex collages. And this was a feature, this was a feature that would really irritate people. She had extended and repeated goodbyes in case it was the last time she saw a person. I have seen this many times, but she did this more excessively than anyone I'd seen. Getting her out of my clinic room was a 10 minute exercise every session because she would, so she would say things like, oh Ross, it was wonderful to see you again today and you've helped me so much. I really want you to know how much you've helped me so far. You have been extremely helpful and uh, I found this work extremely positive. And then she'd think if I said everything. Oh, and I also wanted to say thank you for how quickly you took me on as a patient when I was here visiting because many people wouldn't have done that. And I would like to thank you for that. And she'd think of another thing. And this would uh, go on. It, it irritated family members because <clears throat> a neighbour would come over and she would have to do that for you know, any, any person of significance at any time. Re she had to repeat three neutral C words, cassowary, chocolate, camembert, whenever using a cold water tap to prevent cancer. She had a crossing of lines, doorways to prevent death. She said to me, it doesn't always have to be related to family or loved ones. There was a nurse here the other day. She had a period in hospital. Uh, when, when this first occurred to her, the re-emergence of the symptoms. Uh, I walked past the office here and I saw her through the window on a computer with her back to me. And as my foot was crossing the line where the hard floor meets the carpet, I looked at the back of her head and neck and an OCD thought came in for having a brain tumour and her kids being without their mother. So I ended up crossing over the line, so on and so on and so on. Magical numbers to prevent death. Lately, she said, any repeated sequence of components of rituals, I, I now need to do them five times. If I still haven't, if I don't like the thought, the thought hasn't gone, then seven times. But lately, if it's not resolved by the seventh, I have to go to 17 or 19. I can't go to the 11th because that was my grandpa's birthday, not the 13th, that's not a good number, not the 15th, and so on and so on. This was getting incredibly elaborate. I gave her another of Yolom's books, Creatures of a Day, Wonderful book, the quote of Marcus Aurelius on the cover. All of us are creatures of a day, the rememberer and the remembered alike. All is ephemeral, both memory and the object of memory. The time is at hand when you will have forgotten everything, and the time is at hand when everyone will have forgotten you. Always reflect that soon you will be no one and nowhere. I gave her this particular book because of the hoarding. There was a hoarder in the book. Uh, who, who couldn't let go of someone. And she, she really did very well with that. In fact, after reading of the case and seeing how hoarding was operating for her, she was surprisingly quick in the treatment of the hoarding uh, components. She was able to remove, somehow it validated her own experience, reading a case that seemed so similar in that regard. It was quite striking. It was hard, uh, this is essentially ritual prevention, it was hard to get her to stop inviting her dead father to events. It was hard, uh, but she did do that in the end. She, we had one moment where she, um, at a lunch, uh, dropped her phone and lost it. It went through the planks of, uh, into a lake, into a river. She lost her phone that had a lot of photos of her father. I think it actually helped her. 
I think the fact that the photos were gone and some of those would not be retrieved helped her. And uh, ritual prevention for extended goodbyes. I knew she was doing well when she raced out of the last session. <laughs> uh, the last time I saw her, there was no goodbye. She looked at her watch and she was late for a lunch and there wasn't even a, a nice goodbye. I was a little hurt. No, I wasn't. I wasn't. <laughs> Uh, there wasn't even a nice goodbye. She, she ran off to the lunch, which was excellent. And she was able, in the end, to do very direct exposure to visual images of death. Um, she returned to the UK with apparent ease and uh, no further need for treatment. But as a final thought, I want to read you. I don't want you to think, you know, all is good. I want to read you this email that I got from somebody, because this shows you that the, how hard this is. This shows you how hard this is. And uh, I was quite struck by it. This is a man that we were doing death work with who was really struggling. Sorry, Ross, but I need to say this, he said. Now that I'm facing my death anxiety again, my thoughts have become depressing and I've been crying since I woke. Picture a prisoner about to be executed by electric chair upon arrival at his last meal. No matter how good the food is, the fear of death has besieged the man. The only possible scenario that I could see a person at peace in the face of the electric chair as if he were religious. I can see parallels between the prisoner and myself, no matter the joys offered. Death is approaching, be it tomorrow or 60 years from now, and the fear is consuming me, but it feels more like despair. That's not my main fear, though. It's the knowledge that the executioner will take everything I love away in time. He was referring to his family, he had deep fears of everyone in his family going. Ross, how can I enjoy the meal if my fear of death is consuming me? You can see the dilemma, right? The knowledge of death is something I can't face and no matter which way I turn, it continues to face me. How am I supposed to kid myself into believing it's okay that everything has to decay just because it's a matter of fact? This is all a bit much for me. I know everyone has to face it, but just because everyone's doing it doesn't justify it. What on earth should I do? So I've just made a, that as a final thought. This work isn't easy. Remember the, the, the notion of the worm at the core in all of us. And don't forget our shared humanity. You're traveling, uh, uh, Thomas uh, made that wonderful comment on shared humanity yesterday. Don't forget that. We're all traveling this same path. This is, this is something we're all facing and it's not easy. I don't want to suggest that these death components um, uh, just make these things go away. Uh, this is difficult work, but I think it's important work. And hopefully today from Rachel and I, you've got a sense of the importance of the work and also the creativity of the work, of how interesting the work can be if you start to do some of these tasks. Uh, try to open your mind up to, to varying the work. Look for creative tasks yourselves on, on how to, to, to approach this in a very salient way. It's been, a, it's been a nice afternoon with you all. I hope you've, you've got something out of it and enjoyed it. And thank you very much for your attention. Uh, are there any